All right. Well, let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. I have a question for you. Are you really happy? Amen? All right. We don't want to bear a false witness. It's very important that on this day that we are experiencing the joy of Jesus. And I'm very glad that the joy of the Lord is in your heart, and he's most certainly in mine. God has been doing wonderful things in my life, and I'm very grateful for that. And I trust and I believe that he's doing wonderful things in your lives as well. Today's message is a very important message. It's a very serious message. It's a very solemn message. And it's one that we all get an opportunity to do something that I enjoy doing every day, and that is searching my heart. Being able to make sure, is everything well between myself and my Savior? Am I walking in the line and in the path and in the pattern that he has set for me as his son and as he has set for you, his sons and his daughters? And so for us to receive the blessing, the full blessing, I want to encourage you not only, of course, to have your Bibles, but I want to encourage you to have pen and paper. We're going to study a little bit. We're going to go through verse by verse. We're going to take a look at some verses and let the word of God speak. And I trust that as we not only are going through the word, but taking good notes, go back home, research it, make sure everything the preacher said is true. But then after that, I want you to definitely take a good look at your heart condition and say, Lord, what else is it that could potentially be blocking me from receiving what your spirit wants to give to the church at such a time as this? And so as we prepare our hearts to receive the word, I'm going to go to my knees one more time for a word of prayer, and I'd like to invite you, if you're able to, to kneel with me. Otherwise, just bow your heads where you are, but let's pray together, and let's prepare our hearts to receive what heaven wants to give. Our loving Father, Lord, we are very grateful for this privilege and this opportunity that we have come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We know that there's much that you desire to share with us, and so we just simply pray that you will open our eyes and help us behold wondrous things out of your word. I pray that you might speak plainly to each and every one of our heart needs and help us to find the solution in Christ. For this is our prayer that we ask in the worthy and mighty and matchless name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. You know, um, I was going through some material that I collect. I collect a lot of data. Um, I am one of those individuals that will go to the news. I have certain news outlets that I, that I will read about and look for certain things. You know, I'm a watchman on the wall of Zion, as many of you are. And so I have to pay attention to what's going on in our world and try to always make the connection to see how close is close because we're getting very, very close to the second coming of Christ. And before Jesus comes, there's a crisis that comes first. And I have learned that those who are prepared for the crisis are those who are prepared for the coming Christ. And those who are unprepared for the coming crisis are those who will be unprepared for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the more that I see agitations taking place in our world that are reminding us that time is almost finished. The more that I begin to see what's happening in sea and land and what I see happening in the world of politics and in the world of morality, I can clearly see that we are getting very close to the end of all things. But I've learned something. And this is a hard truth. But I believe that God will give us balance on how it is presented today. I want to ask you to do a little exercise with me, if you don't mind. Just indulge me. I promise you, by God's grace, I will never mislead you. But I want you to indulge me on a little exercise. All of you can see me just fine. Is that right? Yeah? You can see me clear as day, can't you? Now, I want you to do me a favor. I don't care which eye it is. Just close one eye and then keep looking at me. Can you do that on the count of three? Let's just close one eye, and then I want you to just keep looking at me. Ready? Count of three. One, two, three. Just close one eye. Keep looking at me. Okay? Question. Can you still see me? Right? But can you see me as clearly as when you saw me with both eyes? All right. You can open both your eyes again. Thank you for indulging me on that exercise. Now, the, the lesson is very simple. 
we see better through two lenses than we do through one. When we study the Bible, the Bible is like a prophetic lens. It helps us see all things that are going to take place right before the Lord's coming. And the truth of the matter is, is that if we are looking for the nearness of the Lord by simply looking at what's taking place in the world, it is like looking through one lens when God gave you two. I want to give you a prophecy that is most startling. It's in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'm going to ask if we can turn there. Let's go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want us to see something. 2 Timothy, and we're going to chapter 3. When you get there, I'm just going to ask you to please let me know by saying amen. 2 Timothy, we're going to chapter 3. And I want you to see what the Bible says here because this is very eye-opening. And here's what the scripture says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're starting at verse 1. The Bible gives a last day prophecy, and you see it right there in verse 1. Let's notice what it says. It says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, this know also that in what days? It says in the last days, perilous times shall come. Why? It continues, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, when you read something like this, we can almost say, boy, is this an accurate description of the world today. Isn't that right? But do you know that when I more carefully began to look at these verses, you want to know a startling discovery? These verses was not talking about the world. You see, it's in that next verse. In verse 5, here's what it said next. It says, having a form of what? Godliness. Question, does the world have a form of godliness? The world is sinful and the world is bold about their sinfulness. You look at the average billboard today, they are completely unashamed to show forth nakedness. You look at the novels that are being written today, they glorify demons and demonic activity. You look at the television programs today where gluttony is actually now a sport. The world is sinful and the world is very unapologetic about it. It is very bold. They could care less if God approves of it. But there is a place that you and I can go where there's a form, an imagery of godliness. And that's called the church. The various churches all around us, the places where people come professing to worship the true and the living God. The Bible says they will have a form of godliness. But what are they denying? It says, but they deny what? The power thereof. You see, if you look at the statistics in America, let alone the world at large, people are leaving organized religion fast and furious. Young people especially are leaving organized religion. And the reason why is because of the verses that we just read. Because they're seeing that there are individuals in the church that still love pleasure more than they love God. That still are finding themselves being truce breakers, making promises and easily breaking them without feeling any obligation whatsoever. Many are children that are unfortunately and boldly disobedient to their parents. People that no matter how much good is done to them, they demonstrate a spirit of unthankfulness. And this was not the plan of God. And brothers and sisters, the reality 
is that the other lens that God says he wants his people to pay attention to, to know how close is close, is not by just looking at prophecy fulfilled in the world, but prophecy fulfilled in the church. It is when you see through both of these lenses that you and I will realize that he who hides under the shadows of the wings of the Almighty are the ones that will have the refuge. You know, I remember one of the most startling statements that came out of the lips of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, and I want you to look at this. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, there was some words that Jesus shared that in my mind I said, Lord, I can't imagine you saying this to me, and I pray that it will never be the case. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, we're looking at the seventh chapter, it's a story that Jesus was telling. It was a formula of how to be lost as well as how to be saved. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, we're considering the seventh chapter, and I want us to now look at verses 21 to 23. In Matthew chapter 7, we're now looking at verses 21 to 23. When you get there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. All right, now in Matthew 7, starting at verse 21, the Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, here's the saddest words to come out of the lips of Jesus, I never knew you. You have no idea how startling these words are going to be to the group that he's going to say this to. These are people that were spending year upon year upon year upon year serving him. Years and years, even decades, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Individuals that literally were using their hands and their heart and their feet and their whole being, their money, to actually bless people in such a way that it would be best termed miraculous. And all along, Christ will say, you did do a lot of work, but I never had a connection with you. It's not enough to be religious. It's not enough to just have a profession. You'll remember that God introduced his frame of thinking, beloved, and he did it in a most beautiful way in 1 Samuel 16. Let's turn there. In 1 Samuel 16, you'll remember the day came where Samuel and God was so disappointed in King Saul. King Saul was a man of promise. King Saul could have accomplished all sorts of great things for the Lord. But he kept letting himself get in the way of God. It got to a point that God now told Samuel, I need you to go find another man whom I will anoint as the next king. And of course, when Samuel went to Jesse's house, Samuel goes there and he's ready to do a great thing. Samuel is ready to go ahead and identify who that king is and he's going to obviously anoint him under God's instruction. And so he sees Jesse's children and surely there were people there that looked like royalty. You ever met somebody that just looks like royalty? You ever met somebody that just looks like they got it all together? Surely you're a man of God. Surely you're a woman of God. Surely you have some special things about you. Well, here it is that Samuel was human just like you and I. And Ham Samuel seeing people and he eventually sees somebody that he's saying, surely this, this is the one whom the Lord will approve. But then God introduced a most beautiful thought to Samuel. It's found in 1 Samuel 16 in verse 7. Are you there? The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, we're right there in verse 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. And then I love the close. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looks, you take that word look out and you look at it in the Hebrew and it can also be synonymous to judge. Man looks or judges on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks or judges on what? The heart. I'm so thankful for this text. You know, when I first used to come to church, 
30 years ago, right? When I first started coming to church, I'm coming straight out of hip hop. I'm, I'm coming out of the hip hop industry. I mean, I didn't say that I listened to hip hop. I used to walk around saying, I am hip hop. And so, I mean, I loved the music. I loved the industry. I loved everything about it. And, you know, hip hop is a culture. And when you're part of a culture, you talk a certain way, you dress a certain way, you live a certain way. And so when I was coming into the church, I remember I had the real baggy pants. You know, that's what they did back in those days. You know, hip hop is a little different nowadays. But, you know, back in those days, baggy pants was in. That's what the guys would wear. And they would wear their Timberland boots and you would never tie it all the way up. That wasn't cool. You know, you had to let the, let the tongue of the boot hang down, right? And you know, you had to have an oversized shirt and you, you didn't walk like a gentleman, you know? You didn't, you didn't walk with dignity. We used to walk like, you know, we used to have this thing. You know, we used to walk like that. And, 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 and all of that is what made up this hip hop culture. And so I remember that when I came into the church, here I am with my Bible. But I had no suit, I had no reason to own one. So I had no suit, so I had to wear what I had. So I would come to church in my baggy jeans, in my boot with the tongue hanging down, and with my oversized shirt, and with my little bounce when I walked. And I came into church like that. And boy, when I walked into church, oh, how the saints would greet me. They would look at me and say, mm-hmm, happy Sabbath. Nose high. Happy Sabbath. And I'll say, Happy Sabbath, how you doing? And then I'll go to the next one. Hey, happy Sabbath, how you doing? I was just happy to say happy Sabbath. Because I didn't even know about the Sabbath until a few weeks before when I got Bible study. So I'm happy. I'm like, man, I'm going to church. I'm keeping Sabbath. I'm a happy brother. But everybody else, was, mm -hmm, happy Sabbath. And they judging me and all this other stuff. But here it is. God said, the Lord does not judge on the appearance. But the Lord judges on that what? On that heart condition. Now, please understand, I obviously am wearing a shirt and tie today. I believe that God has made it clear in his words that as the Sabbath day is special, we should have a Sabbath suit that is special to be worn on that day. But it took time for me to get that education. But what the people did not know was that they were looking at a man that was madly falling in love with Jesus. God saw this young man's heart. God knew. You people don't understand. Y'all are looking just at his appearance. You don't understand. This boy has a heart that seeks me. And God saw one day, I'm going to have his heart. And when I have his heart, oh, yeah, God cleaned me up. Now my dress is different. My demeanor is different. Now I walk, you know, I don't have the bounce anymore. You know, it's like, now, nah, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I'm dignified. I'm still in the process of polishing. But the Lord has accomplished a mighty work thus far. But God knew all along, this boy has a heart that's chasing me. And we would do well to remember that when we come in contact with certain folks. Because sometimes on the appearance, we could be like Samuel and we can look and judge. Where God says, oh, if you only knew how much that that woman and that man is chasing after me. And if you had a heart like his or hers how much better off the church could be. You see, beloved, God is trying to make it clear that there's people in church that are making a profession. You see, I, I remember doing a Bible study, Carlos and Lissandra, can't forget it. And I remember that I was doing this Bible study and I'm breaking down the word, I'm, I'm teaching, and I'm trying to help them understand the truth as it is in Jesus, the present truth. And I remember Carlos loved it. Carlos was like, oh, this is great. And he's just receiving it. Because Lissandra was different. She was, she was like, amen. But she had this reluctancy. So I'm going over everything. You know, Carlos, is there anything holding you back from being baptized? Carlos said, no, I want to be baptized. Lissandra, how about yourself? She says, not ready yet. And I'll say, OK, what is it that's hindering you, my sister? She says, I'm not really sure. I said, is it this doctrine? Because I know some people find it to be a struggle. No. Is it this doctrine? Because I know some people find this to be a struggle. No. I said, well, then what, what could it be, my sister? She says, I'm just not sure. So I'm praying. Ministers got to pray. Lord, what's going on? You know hearts. You know the heart. What's going on? And on my drive the following week to do the next Bible study, God told me, 
he impressed on my heart, teach her about the apostasy that will come within the ranks. And I'm thinking to myself, uh, Lord, I'm trying to get her to join us. <laughs> you know, like, it, it was just so clear, Lord, I'm trying to get her to join us. If I go over that, that's going to have an opposite impact. But it was clear as day, teach her what will come amongst my people. And so what did I do? I said, all right. So I said, uh, Carlos and the sergeant, I said, I got something deep to show you. I said, we've been studying Bible prophecy. We talked a lot about the lens of what's going on in the world. I said, I want to talk to you a little bit about another lens of what's going to go on in the church, what's going to happen amongst God's people. They said, what is that? I said, what you're going to discover is that uh, in the last days, many in the church will begin practicing all sorts of abominations. And I began to go through them through Ezekiel 8, one by one. Abominations that are being practiced amongst the people of God. I said, not only that, but according to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, you will see that many of the church will repeat the very sins that Israel used to do in their wilderness journey. You'll see that happen amongst the people of God. And I remember Lysandra's eyes just started to light up. Then I said, and many in the church will become very, very self-righteous, self-exalting. They will think more of themselves than they should. They will think that they're all right when they're all wrong. And I said, and saddest of all, sister, I said, many in the church will allow God's love to fade away from their hearts because of the rise of sin. I said, this is what's going to happen to many. I'm so thankful that it's not all, but it will be many in the church. And I remember that as I went through that, I said, now, do you want to be part of the few or do you want to be part of the many? You see, is your Bible still in Matthew 7? You see, the, the, the context of Matthew 7, what we, what we, when we read Matthew 7, go back there. When we read Matthew 7, that question that I asked my friend Lysandra is the same question that I'm asking you today. You see, when Jesus made those statements in verses 21 to 23 of Matthew 7, it was a continuum of what was mentioned earlier on in the chapter. If you go up in Matthew 7 to verse 13, look at what the Bible says. It was in Matthew 7 and verse 13 that the Bible says, enter ye in at what kind of gate? Oh, yes, it's a straight gate. Another word for straight is strict. A straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And what's the next word? Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and how many? Few there be that find it. You see, when I told Lysandra, I said, Lysandra, I said, listen, I'm letting you know right now, church, a church, the church is nothing different than a hospital, and every hospital has more sick people than well people. The majority are sick, the well are few. Now you have an opportunity to enter into this hospital, and the truth is you're gonna run into some sick people. OK. But you have an option. You can be counted amongst the sick and suffering or you can be counted amongst the well and the healing. It's going to be your choice. You're going to have two camps that you can join. Which camp do you want to join? You see, God is trying to raise up a people that are going to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And I said, Lysandra, will you be part of the solution. And I remember Lysandra's eyes. She said, Brother Lemon, she says, I'm ready to get baptized. And so I was like, wow. I said, tell me why. She says, I visited the church and I saw some things in the people that I did not like. 
And it was making me feel like, I don't know, how could this be the people of God when you have people that are acting in ways that are not like God? And I said, sister, it's all part of the plan of redemption. But God has called you and called me to come in and to be part of the solution. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you the truth. When I joined this church, I had some very foul examples set before me. I had individuals who were elders, individuals who were pastors, people who were supposed to be excellent examples before me. And they were not excellent examples. There were sometimes things that they would do and things that they would say and things that they would advocate that I was thinking to myself, how could you do that? I'm from the world and I know that that's wrong. But you know what I realized? God called me to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. The Bible has prophesied that in the last days, the enemy is going to attack the church. Go to Matthew 16. You see, you, prob you, you read it, but I don't know if you caught it. You see, look at Matthew, the 16th chapter. You'll see it right there. It was always there. It's just sometimes we didn't consider it. In Matthew 16, you remember Jesus went through a story. Jesus was talking about some things that was going to take place. You'll remember that in Matthew 16, right at verse 13, Jesus is having a dialogue with his disciples. And as he's talking with his disciples, he asked them a question. It's in Matthew 16. And now let's go ahead and consider verse 13. In Matthew 16 and verse 13, what does the Bible say? It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and others Jeremiah, or so one of the prophets. He saith unto them, well, who do you say that I am? Because that's what matters. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. Jesus wants to know, what do you say? Who do you say that I am? So he asked him that question, and bold Peter. Peter's always the first brother to talk. And here it is, Peter comes along, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now watch this, here we go, watch this, verse 17 and 18. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18 is key. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, the rock that Peter confessed, Christ, and upon this rock, I will build my church. That's the first time the word church appears in the New Testament. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And what's the promise? And the gates of hell shall not what? But what we don't realize is there was also an inference in that verse. The gates of hell shall not prevail, but the gates of hell are going to attack it. That's the inference in the verse. The gates of hell will not win, but the gates of hell is going to attack it. When I made a decision to be part of this church, truly, I joined the Lord's army. And so did you. And right now we are church militant. Soon and very soon by the grace of God to become church triumphant. But we're going to have to go through some battle scars. And so the reality, beloved, is that the devil knows that God has a plan. You see, the world is ready for all of those final things we read in the book of Revelation to come to pass. We're basically seeing a consistent recycling of stuff that already happened. Christian nationalism has been on the menu for many, many years. It's not just in these past couple of years that Christian nationalism has been talked about. Christian nationalism has been talked about for years, if not decades. The papacy has already made it clear as day that they want to establish law mixed with religion. They've made that clear. Protestantism has apostatized from years and years and years ago. Spiritualism is at an all-time high. You can't even give a child a cartoon. 
without them being full-blown educated in spiritualism. In other words, a lot of this stuff is already going on. It's just continually manifesting itself in new and unique ways. But what is God really waiting on? He's waiting on you and he's waiting on me. The more that we can cooperate to break out of this stupidity and lethargy that many in the church have fallen into, the sooner that you and I can really get on board with what Christ is calling us to do, we can see all these things finally wrap up and we can go home. But it's going to require a deeper cooperation than we have ever yet cooperated with God. Praise the Lord for whatever it is that you and I have done thus far in our demonstration of devotion and love to Jesus, but he wants more. Please don't get satisfied. It's dangerous. Please, family, I'm serious. Don't get satisfied. There's more about Jesus you would learn. There's more about Jesus I would learn. There is more sanctification to take place in your life. There's more sanctification to take place in my life. We have not arrived yet. And please don't walk and act and function like you have because you can end up thinking more of yourself than you and I really are and we can start saying that we're rich and increase with goods. The great goal of God is to restore all things back to the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. I want you to see what God wants from us. Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, I want you to see what God wants from us. Genesis 1. The great focus of Jesus is to fulfill what he planned to do with mankind from the beginning. And I want you to see it. He's going to get what he wants, too. I learned that about God. I remember one time, you go into Genesis 1, I was in Australia. And when I was in Australia, we were walking around and looking at many of the institutes that got started under this movement that was designed to be lighthouses for the Lord. And many of them were closed, shut down, owned by people that have no belief in any truth of the Bible. And I remember that as I was walking there, it's like as I was walking around, it was so clear that I was like, God is going to get what he wants. He's very patient. He's very long suffering, as we know. 120 years he waited in the days of Noah. But God is going to get what he wants. He's not going to compromise for you and I because he allowed people to die for truth. And he's not going to let their death be in vain. And so I remember that we were there and I, and I told one of the, the people who had given me the tour, I said, you know, I said, we need to learn that God really means what he says, and, and he is determined to get what he wants. And if he doesn't get what he wants, he will let things close and shut down. And that's what we're seeing right now, what's happening over here, all these institutes that used to be God's lighthouses, and now they're just dormant. We have to get on God's page. Now, what is God's page? Right there in Genesis 1. Look at verses 26 and 27. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, look at what the Bible says. It says in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, and God said, let us make man in what? Our image and after what? Our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now don't lose this part. Verse 28. It says next, And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and what? Replenish the earth. Bad word. When I teach how to study the Bible, I say a lot of good things about the King James Version. But when we get to Genesis 1 verse 28, this is when I have to say something bad about the King James Version. That word replenish is a very bad word. Because to replenish indicates that something was there beforehand. Do you understand that? You can't re-anything without it having had existed beforehand. Are you following? And that's why if somebody in here does not have a King James Version and was looking at Genesis 1.28, it would say, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's a better word, fill the earth. You got that? You go to the Hebrew for the word replenish, it means fill. So watch this. 
Adam and Eve was made in God's image. Let's talk about the purpose of the church. Adam and Eve was made in God's image. And what did God want? He wanted his image to fill the whole earth. Are you following that? That's what God wanted. That's his original plan with his people. Reflect my image all over the world. Now, you want to know why I said God's going to get what he wants? Go to Revelation 18. The last gospel message to be given to the world. This is the last gospel message to be given to the world, okay? The last gospel message to be given to the world is in Revelation 18. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, this is the last gospel message to be given to the world. What does the Bible say? Notice. Now, before I read, quick little story. It's a biblical story, but I'll let you go ahead and read it in your spare time. Quick story. Moses loved God so much that he made a very personal request that a friend can make. It was found in Exodus 33 and verse 18. Moses said, Lord, I beg of you, let me see your glory. In verse 19, God responds by saying, I'll show you all my goodness and I'll proclaim my name. So Moses and God are having a conversation. Amen? Yeah? They're having a conversation. Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God responds, I'll show you my goodness and proclaim my name. Are they having a conversation? Sure. So that's like me saying, Melissa, please show me your car. And she says, no problem. I'll show you my Subaru. Are we talking about the same thing? But did we use the same words? No. But we're talking about the same thing, right? Okay. So in Exodus 33, 18, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God says, okay, I'll show you my goodness and proclaim my name. So the first lesson is, the goodness of God, the name of God, and the glory of God are synonymous. Amen? All right, good. So when you go to Exodus 34, 5 through 7, God does it. The Bible says this. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. I'm quoting. It's Exodus 34, 5 through 7. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation, end quote. What did God show Moses? His character. So the glory of God is a revelation of God's character. You follow that? All right, Revelation 18. Now I think you can appreciate the verse better. In Revelation 18, starting at verse 1, it says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his what? Glory. What is glory? God's glory is a revelation of his? Imagine that. God's going to get what he wants. From the beginning of time, what did God want? Take my image, my character, fill the earth with it. By the time you get to the end of time in Revelation 18, we're not here yet, yet. Not now, right now, March 18, 2023. We're not here yet, but we're getting closer. But Revelation 18 makes it clear, a day is going to come where the earth is going to be filled with the character of God. Jesus is waiting for a perfect reflection of his character in you and in me. And when he gets that, we go home. but not until then. Can you understand why the devil's working so hard to get us to practice abominations and to repeat the sins of Israel and to become self-righteous and to let God's love fade away? Can you see why the devil's working so hard to keep us there? Because the more he can succeed keeping us there, there is no second coming. Are you following, family? There's no second coming. 
We'll be 50 years from now talking about the Lord is coming. But he never comes because he cannot come until he has a people that have finally had such an indissoluble love connection with him that we allow him to help us overcome that. That's why John called him the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so the question is, how do we get here, Lord? How do we get to this place that we can finally be the people that will be part of the solution, not part of the problem? How can we, Lord, be the people that you can work in and work through that we can overcome these things that are such a distraction and a hindrance for all things being finished? And the answer that I leave with you is Jesus. Your excellent example. There are three things that Christ did to keep him focused and to keep him alert and to keep him above the entrapments of sin and allowed him to finish his work. And these three things that I'm going to put on the screen are for you and for me. These three things about Jesus, I want you to learn it. I want you to study it. I want you to join me on this journey. I have not arrived, but I'm on the road. I'm on the road. I can promise you that. But I haven't arrived yet. There's more about Jesus I would learn. I mean every bit of what I'm telling you. There's more about Christ I would learn. But right now, family, I am waiting for a phone call to let me know potentially that there's someone very dear to myself and others that might be passing away. And it's sad. And it's like I have been dealing with death so much. And it just feels like you're surrounded by this stuff all the time. And they're getting younger and younger. And it's just like, it's like a lot of the things that we chase after in this world, like the song says, the things of this earth are growing strangely dim. This is, God is trying to get us to, to refocus and to really understand the great purpose of the gospel, the great purpose of the church, and why he came here. And the goal is to eventually get out of here. But in order for that to happen, there's a greater cooperation that we need with God. And we're already in March. This year is already moving fast. And we need to penetrate this community. We need our homes penetrated with the gospel. We know that there's some dark stuff going on inside of our hearts that we have been indulging and cultivating and allowing it to live and to grow. And it is thoroughly unlike Christ, and there's no way God could save us while that stuff is still in our characters. And the Lord is really speaking to us, saying, when can I finally get my people on the page that I'm on? We make excuses. Oh, look at all those people in the church. Look at how ungodly they are. Family, God told us that this stuff was going to happen, didn't he? These things shouldn't surprise us. You and I must develop a laser focus on Christ. Look, everybody has to do what they're doing. We used to say in business, believe in everybody, wait for no one. And there's a lot of truth to that in the church. Listen, I believe in you. I know that in the strength of Jesus, you can have victory. But I'm not going to wait for you to have victory before I get the victory I need. I got to walk with him. And I got to focus on him. And I cannot allow other people to distract me in my walk with God. And so I want you to remember your excellent example. I'm not your example. There is no pastor. There's no evangelist. There's nobody. The arms of flesh are always going to fail you, beloved. Stop looking at man. Look at God. He's your excellent example. And when you behold excellence, don't settle for anything less. And there's three things that are excellent example left for you and for me that we can follow. I want you to consider these three things. This is what gave Jesus victory. This is what helped him to overcome. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us, but he did not function like God on this earth. He functioned like a human being like you and me. So what I'm putting on the screen was literally the secret formulas of how Jesus lived a victorious life in a thoroughly sinful world and in a church filled with a lot of sinners because it was church people that killed him. 
This is how Jesus made it. And nothing less will help you and I make it. Number one. Mark 1, 35, Luke 5, 15 and 16, Luke 6, 12. Now, I want to be mindful of our time. We probably have about 10 more minutes or so. What I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage us to just look at Mark 1 and verse 35. You can read the other verses in your spare time, take pictures, etc., and we'll talk about it. Go to Mark 1 and verse 35. I just want to show you this principle. Mark 1 and verse 35. We're talking about three things that Christ did that really positioned him, helped him to have power to resist the enemy and to overcome the wiles of Satan. Mark 1 and verse 35. Three things, and then we're going to close it out. In Mark 1 and verse 35, let's see what the Bible says. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. All right. In Mark 1 and verse 35, the Bible says, and in the morning rising up a great while before day. He went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You read the same account in Luke 5, 15 and 16. He was in the middle of the day healing people. And the Bible says he withdrew himself and spent time with God in the wilderness. In Luke 6 and verse 12, it says after he finished working with everyone, he went up into the mountains at night and spent time in communion with God. What was one of the key secrets of how Jesus was able to stay above the minutia that was taking place not only in the world, but in the church? He, brothers and sisters, had intense, unbroken communion with his father. Jesus had intense, unbroken communion with his father. There's no way that you and I can have weak, slipshod communion with God and have enough strength to endure the trials that are coming ahead. There's just no way, family. It's not going to happen. That precious little book, Ministry of Healing, page 51, it says the Savior's life. There's a first sentence. It says the Savior's life on earth was a life of communion with nature and with God. It says, and in this communion, he revealed for us the secret to a life of power, end quote. Christ prioritized his time with his father. He knew I am no good to these people if I don't get my time with God. And the devil's greatest trap, and this is a warning to pastors, ministers, and evangelists. This is a warning especially to us, but it's to all of God's people. The devil's going to try to keep you so busy that your devotion gets crowded out. Satan knows it. In the book Christ Object Lessons, page 52, it's called The Chief Secret of Failure in Christian Work. It's to work so hard for other people's good that your devotion time becomes weak and shallow and sporadic. It is Satan's master plan to get us off guard. We must work for others, but we must learn how to even tell the beloved saints, I am not available right now. I am spending time with God. You're not selfish. You're not sinful. You're just like Jesus. Jesus knew I got to get time with my father. And so a great while before day, he's having communion. Sometimes in the middle of the day, he's having communion. Then sometimes he would stay up all night having communion. Why? Because he had to get charged. So that's principle number one. Jesus had unbroken, intense communion with the Father. There's no way we're going to make it through these final scenes unless we develop these same habits, beloved. You're going to have to probably reschedule yourselves, but we can do it. Number two, in Acts 10 and verse 38, the Bible says, he went about doing good. God anointed him with the Holy Ghost, and he went about doing good. What's the lesson? His life was a life of self-sacrificial service. You cannot be too busy to help other people. Jesus avoided idle time by spending time, even sometimes sacrificing things that he could have been doing elsewise, but he lived a lifestyle of self-sacrificial service to others. This must be your lifestyle. This must be my lifestyle. Is Lord, where is it in my life that I could spend more try time trying to help uplift others in the low places of life? Where is it that I can do a Bible study, do something where I can help others to come to know you as it is their privilege to know you? I lied to you not. 
as soon as I joined the church 30 years ago, I started having Bible studies with people who did not know God's word. For 30 years, I still study with people who do not know God the way I'm privileged to know him. And I can't tell you how Proverbs 11.25 is true. He who waters gets watered also. Never become too busy that you cannot invest in a soul and help their lives get better. This was one of Jesus' formulas. He knew what the effect it was going to have on him, and he understands the effect it's going to have on you. You can't be too busy, family. I know some of us are in school. Some of us are working hard. We're parents. In the book Welfare Ministry, page 129, we're told even the mother who homeschools should take her children with her and still go and do missionary work. Even when you're that precious homeschooling mother, train your children to be fellow evangelists with you while you go minister to somebody else. At no point, we must live a lifestyle. I used to always laugh when people say, this is the year of evangelism. I'm like, well, what were you doing last year? <laughs> we, we, evangelism is a lifestyle. It's not something you cut on and cut off. Evangelism is a lifestyle. You're always an evangelist. You're always sharing. You're looking for opportunities. You're on an airplane, on a bus, whatever. You're looking for opportunities. How can I share with others? Lastly, in 1 Peter 2, 19 through 22, I want us to turn to that text. This is our last text anyhow. Let's turn there. In 1 Peter 2, 19 through 22, let's look at this one. It's a little deep. 1 Peter 2, 19 through 22, I want you to see this because this is our, our last lesson from our Savior. This, this is a lifestyle of Jesus. This was not an event. This was not just something he did here or there. It was his lifestyle. He lived a lifestyle of intense, unbroken communion with God. He also lived a lifestyle of self-sacrificial service to others. Lastly, what's the last lesson? 1 Peter 2, 19 through 22. The Bible says this. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully... For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? In other words, if you and I mess up and we know we did wrong and then we're suffering for it, don't boast about that. Don't walk around sticking your chest out saying, I'm suffering for the Lord's sake. It's like, don't do that. Take it patiently. Just bear it. We made mistakes. Now we're suffering for it. Bear it patiently. But let's continue. It says next, but... If when you do well and suffer for it and you take it patiently, oh, this is acceptable with God. It says, for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But what did he do? He committed himself to him that judges righteously. What's the last lesson? Regardless of the pressure, he did no sin and guile was not found in his mouth. Regardless of the pressure, no matter how hard Jesus was suffering, he would never choose to knowingly do wrong and to practice deceit. And sometimes that's hard for us. I get it. And God has plenty of grace. For where sin abounds, thank the Lord, grace does much more abound. But Jesus wants us to understand that we are on a road that one day we're going to have a high priest that's going to say, let him who's filthy be filthy still. And let him who's holy be holy still. So what does that mean? That means today we want to start cooperating with God better. That he can give us his strength. That when tempted to do those things that are wrong, we will say, Lord, please give me more of your grace to choose to still do that which is right. We are on a road, family. The end of the road arrives in the arms of Jesus. And Jesus wants us to understand that we are living in a time where things are getting very serious because the world is in trouble and the churches are in trouble. The devil is trying to put his footprint in both places. 
And this is going to require the people of God who have chosen to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem to make some firm decisions. And that firm decision is to fix your eyes on your excellent example. To look at Jesus as the one who went through all of what we have gone through, who has suffered the things that we have suffered. This morning I was going through a book that I believe is one of the best books I've read in years. It's called The Hidden Half of the Gospel. And my brothers and sisters, I have never seen someone so successfully relate Christ and his sufferings to the sufferings that others go through. This morning, the sufferings of Christ dealing with being abused. And I was going through how Jesus was thoroughly abused. And I'm like, Jesus is so perfect for every person who has ever suffered verbal, mental, emotional, and physical abuse. Christ is your perfect suffering Messiah because he literally can say, I have suffered verbal abuse. I have suffered mental, emotional abuse. I have suffered physical abuse. And I rose above it. Now let me show you how you can rise above it too. Family, I'm telling you the truth. With Jesus, we can get to a place that we can love the things he loves and we can hate the things he hates. And the Bible is very clear in Hebrews 1 and verse 9. The Bible says he loves righteousness and he hates iniquity. Do you know the more you commune with Christ, you could have the same love-hate relationship? You could love righteousness and you can hate iniquity. Family, I want to encourage you today that while there's a lot of stuff going on, not just in the world, but in the church, God has promised that the church with the lamb wins in the end. Amen. And there will be many that will fall to the right and to the left. Sadly, they were more part of the problem. But God has given you an opportunity to be part of the solution, to walk with Jesus. And guess what? When you realize that I've been called to be part of the solution, and when you choose to be part of the solution, we get on a road. And we're on a journey now, walking with the Lord, seeking to walk in his footsteps. And you know what's so beautiful about this? Is as you're walking on the journey, you're going to see a brother that's distracted. And you're going to say, hey, come join me on the journey. And then you're going to see a sister to your left who's distracted. And you're going to say, hey, come join me on the journey. And by God's grace, that's what I wanted to do today, to let you know I'm on the road. I haven't arrived, but I'm on the journey. Hey, come join me on this journey. Let's get on this journey to cooperate with God, to realize that time is almost finished. There's a lot happening in the world and in the church, and God has a solution. The church will be triumphant, but it's going to come at a cost. It's going to require your total and complete and ample surrender. And so if there's anybody in this room that says, you know what? I've heard the voice of God today. The Lord has spoken to my heart. And I admit, I may not have been cooperating with God as I should have. But today I am willing, by the grace of God, to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And I'm going to fix my eyes on my excellent example from this day forward and neither turn to the right or to the left. If that's you, please stand to your feet with me. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. And I want you to know that if God be for us, who can be against us? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And family, like I told you some months ago, by the grace of God, we need to light this city of Folsom up with this everlasting gospel. May God begin with us so we can spread it.